Okay. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone feeling? Yeah. Wow. Looking good from here. So uh, thanks for uh, making this possible. I'm really glad to see all of you here and, and to be able to talk uh, a little less formally, a, a little less politically, and really focus on creativity, what it has meant in my life and what it means to us going forward. So, did I hit the wrong button already? Dang. Okay, so this is where we live. This is our planet. We're really lucky to be here. And we should never forget that. And uh, in these times, we're facing all kinds of uh, challenges that could never have been imagined. We've been through lots before. Our ancestors have come through extraordinary challenges over and over and over. But uh, what we face now uh, from climate change and Hurricane Sandy to, uh, this is a, a, an epic scale pothole in Vancouver. And mayors have to pay attention to potholes. <laughs> There, this is all connected. The, the change that we're uh, facing around the world right now is uh, off the charts. And the only way that we're going to be able to deal with it, the only way we have generations and generations to come who can live and thrive and create uh, amazing things on this planet is if we take care of uh, business here. And uh, that's, uh, uh, there are a lot of ways to do that. And applying creativity is, is a, has to be at the core to solving these problems that we have. And they can be uh, uh, all kinds of forms. It can be social entrepreneurship. It can be uh, design for social and environmental change. It can be grassroots democracy. I'm going to talk a bunch about politics uh, and government um, because that's what I do with uh, every fiber of my being right now. Politics is our most direct way to create change. It's the, it's the mechanism that we have designed uh, as uh, animals to make change and, and govern our community. But very few of us really get involved in it directly. Just uh, to get a sense of that, how many people in this room and, and watching are directly involved in politics? Would say your, your life is full of politics. Hands up. Okay, a very small number of hands. How many of you can imagine politics becoming a big part of your life? Uh, oh, all right. Okay, you talk to uh, Lara or Stepan over there on your way out. <laughs> Just really, yeah, it's all about who shows up for it. How many would say that politics is a creative realm? Okay, well there was some hesitation there, but good to see hands up. And I'm going to come back around to that because uh, I, I think, I'm hoping I can influence more hands going up about creativity in politics and government, that those things actually work really well together and they have to work really well together for us to uh, succeed, for us to ultimately uh, make what we want to happen on this planet. So I'm going to just tell uh, uh, some stories because uh, we're going from today, uh, the city of destiny in Vancouver here, but um, my story goes back to being a, a kid growing up here. I kind of was back and forth between here. I lived a few years in uh, San Francisco growing up. I never ever imagined I would be in politics as a kid, a as, an, as an adult, most of my adult life as well. I was uh, inquisitive and curious and creative, but my focus was really um, on music growing up. This was my first drum set, and it was a piece of trash, but it, it got me through, uh, and this is uh, my band, my first band. <laughs> I took the picture, so I, I figured I'd just bring a bunch of pictures and, uh, to illustrate uh, my path through all this stuff. Uh, we did a lot of KISS covers, we were really into KISS, and uh, a little bit of Leonard Skinner on the side. Free Bird was always our closer. <laughs> so, uh, once I had, had grown up and, and basically in the confines of North America, I was so curious to, to travel and see the rest of the world. Uh, my first trip away from North America was uh, to Asia, and uh, partly to uh, see what my, uh, my ancestor, my, my relative, Dr. Norman Bethune from Canada had done there because I grew up kind of, no one else in Canada knew who he was until more recently, but in our family it was a big deal. So um, I was intrigued with what was happening there. And in China, particularly a couple decades ago, it was all about bicycles. Everybody rode bicycles. It was a stunning sight to see an entire uh, country riding bicycles everywhere. That's changed dramatically, but um, 
I rode uh, one of the first bike tours uh, in 1986 when they opened the borders in China and got to, got to ride all over uh, in northern China, primarily Beijing to Shanghai. Uh, and it was a real eye-opener for me. I really wanted to keep traveling. My sweetheart and I, Amy, uh, we, we ended up fixing up this boat. Uh, it looked like a piece of junk when we got it. We spent a year and a half. We uh, fixed it up, put her back in the water, and we went sailing across the Pacific for a, about a year and a half as well. And what, what really drew us from place to place was food. I mean, literally having to survive uh, on the ocean. <laughs> Catching fish and every island you got to was, uh, so you didn't get scurvy, you had to find fruit. And, but discovering the cultures and the importance of food, particularly on small islands in, in the middle of the Pacific, they, um, they pay a lot of attention to food. So this was a, a bit of a, a fantasy life too, to experience the uh, open ocean. Uh, we did not have uh, GPS in those days, it was old school. So um, finding, uh, finding your way was a really important piece of it. And it was a metaphor that has become important throughout my, the rest of my life. Always knowing roughly where you are and knowing where you're going. Uh, literally, that was uh, the only way I survived uh, for, for that, that period of time. Uh, it, I think it's in, enormously important just guiding us through life that we have some sense of navigation and placing ourselves in, in uh, the bigger scheme of things. So, um, I came back uh, from sailing. Amy and I came back here and uh, decided to, to dive into the food industry, food system, understand it better, become farmers. There weren't a lot of people our age becoming farmers at the time, so we were, it was a creative approach to building a new career and um, figuring out how food works uh, here close to at home. So uh, we had um, organic farming at, our, at the roots of it. We had to be really creative and innovative in everything that we did to compete, because making a living in farming is very difficult. Uh, it's still difficult, even with the farmers markets and all the rest of it. You have to specialize in certain crops, you have to do something different, you have to market very directly. You do make mistakes. This is a, an enormous uh, bok choy harvest that uh, we did not manage to sell all of because bok choy wasn't the most popular thing in the world, but, but we did make a fortune selling artichokes uh, back in the day. Turns out we were the only growers of artichokes for a while there. So, but that was how it was. Uh, and the impact of what we did, I, I decided, was needed to be scaled. And, uh, and I saw lots of great growers. I didn't see that food connecting in the city as well. So Amy was actually starting farmer's markets. I started Happy Planet with a friend named Randy Ias. And uh, this is actually our first juice truck. Uh, shortly after it was totaled doing a juice delivery, uh, we hung onto it in our parking lot for a little while because we were attached to it. But, uh, we had to be very creative as a juice company. Creative Juices was actually the first name of our, our company. And then Happy Planet uh, came to mind and Happy Planet took over as the name. It is a much better name. But, but Creative Juices was what we were all about. The only way to compete with the Coke and Pepsis uh, of this world, uh, the only way to, to, um, to compete in the food industry is to be really creative and hustle. And that's what we had to do building, uh, that, building our business up across Canada. Uh, we um, also saw the real impact on the ground of, of, uh, of what happens in a community when government makes uh, decisions that don't benefit the community. All of our marketing basically was giving juice to uh, local organizations, to festivals, to, uh, to the shelters and uh, soup kitchens here in the downtown east side. Where we are right now was, was really a, a pivotal point for me. The Woodward squat was happening. And we always made a little bit too much juice to make sure we, we made enough. And all the extra juice had to be drank right away. So we'd bottle it up and we'd, we'd run it uh, basically mostly around the downtown east side. And we um, fed lots of people that way with fresh uh, juice right off the presses. So the Woodward squat was, uh, was, came at a time when, um, when the provincial government had decided to, uh, to really clamp down on welfare, to uh, to basically start a war on the poor. And that, that has lasted for many years and it's cre created an enormous amount of homelessness. It's pushed people with mental health issues out on the streets into dire conditions. Uh, addiction uh, obviously is interlaced there. But um, seeing that impact was, um, was a real eye-opener and, and thinking, well, we've, we're doing all these interesting things in business now. We're connecting to all kinds of triple bottom line business that's creative, that's changing the world, that's uh, actually viral into the 
the uh, Fortune 500 companies and transforming the way they look at sustainability. Um, but what's government doing? So, I, you know, I started asking those questions, uh, I guess, out loud, um, for better or for worse, and people said, well, why don't you get into politics? <laughs> and I just, never it even occurred to me that that would be somewhere I could contribute. But um, in the same kind of fashion that I've, uh, that I've gone after other things in my life and thought, this is, okay, this isn't what I ever thought about doing before, but here's a new opening, here's a new idea, and, um, and embrace the creativity of it rather than thinking of all the blocks and, oh my God, I, how could I ever take anything like that on? It's not, uh, it's not what I do. So that's, that for me is a big part of creativity is just being open, almost like improvisation. Something is coming next. The, the world is, is offering up some opportunities and some change and you can either go with it or you can stick with uh, your current path. So I ended up going with it and, and I had an, an incredible number of people who helped uh, from 2004 on, when I said I want to run for office, I, I had all kinds of people helping right away. And that's the only way it works. Politics truly is grassroots. The only way to, to get into it is to have a whole community of people that rise up around you, that organize, that, that make it happen. And uh, I, you know, I, I do a, a part of that, but it's an incredible team of people that I work with that make it possible. And, and that's, uh, that's all community driven at its core. So. We're, we're blessed to live in this extraordinary city uh, right now. And I, what I, what I uh, see as, as our opportunity is that a city can be a very nimble and entrepreneurial uh, creature. The cities are the foundation of society as we know it. And cities are, have always kind of held together. Companies come and go. Uh, communities and cities in particular have lasted for, for millennia. And uh, if they're taken care of properly, but that also means embracing change, because when you see this place, this picture right here, uh, 125 years ago was a forest and beaches and some small uh, First Nations villages. And uh, we're, we're blessed to be on the land of the Coast Salish First Nations here, who have been incredibly patient and uh, forgiving uh, of all of us piling in here and enjoying a, a great place. And, um, uh, we have a lot more work to do. We've had this kind of change in 125 years, and uh, it's, it's almost unthinkable the kind of change we're going to see over the next 125 years. But cities is, is, is where the innovation uh, is going to happen. That's the level of government that's going to embrace the day-to-day -day change and the pivotal change that we need to make uh, as well, big communities. Um, we've done some really interesting things uh, in, in the four years since I've been the mayor. Uh, we have set big goals for ourselves, like ending street homelessness by 2015. Um, on day one, uh, the creative approach on that front was, okay, let's get a bunch of the smartest people in Vancouver on homelessness and working on shelters. How do we get as many people, we had about uh, 800 people, 800 to 1,000 people sleeping on the streets uh, four years ago in the winter. And uh, we had someone die, really, at the be right at the beginning of that winter. And it, it was horrific, the kind of conditions people were living in. Well, the, the creative idea was let's open, just open shelters, low barrier, anyone can come in, shopping carts, dogs, using uh, substances, you, we'll, we'll, we'll have some latitude with that, so people will come in that have never come in, that people that have been stuck outside for years and years and years, thanks to, unfortunately, government policy, uh, not giving them an opportunity, well, we're just gonna open doors, have a, a warm place to sleep, and food, and there were a lot of people in the in in the business, so to speak, in the industry that said, "Well, that's not going to work. You're going to have absolute chaos if you just throw the doors open." But the way we approached it was, we got to do something new and different. That's the only way we're going to get hundreds of people off the street before uh, before uh, the snow. So it worked. We had hundreds and hundreds of people come in. About 500 people came into those shelters that first winter. Um, many people, uh, for the first time in years, and their lives were transformed. They're, this is a picture of a guy who fixes watches. Um, and I just thought his hands were extraordinary. Uh, this was at a homeless count last year, actually, uh, out in the street with Judy Graves. And again, people working at the city who do phenomenal work connecting with uh, those who need it most on the ground. But we can't fix it all ourselves. It's got to be partners, the provincial government, the federal government. It's leveraging all the support that we can get because uh, it turns out those are the governments that we pay taxes to to, to deal with the stuff. We just got to keep their feet to the fire. 
So we've seen transformation on that front. Uh, we're not done yet. There's still people sleeping outside this winter, but, um, but again, creative approaches, creative ways to get people from shelters into housing is what we're doing now. Different supportive housing, focusing on one person at a time and supporting them with all the needs that, th that they have. So Greenest City has been another big piece of, of creative work that we're doing. Um, we had a Talk Green to Us uh, campaign. I guess you'd say 35,000 people here in Vancouver took part in it. We had um, about 800 different ideas that came up on the Talk Green to Us website and people voted on them. How many people here took part in that? Weighed in on the Talk Green to Us, Greenest City work? So that, that ended up generating all kinds of different ideas, stimulating uh, all sorts of new partnerships like uh, post-secondary students, all the students at universities and colleges in Vancouver. Um, we, we now have a program where they can actually do work at the city, working on our Greenest City goals, get some hands-on applied experience, and uh, get credit for it at their, uh, at their school. So that's sort of ramped up the, the, the firepower that we have at the city to make these kind of changes. And we're seeing uh, all kinds of changes. Here's an example of Soul Food, which is an urban farm in the most unlikely uh, setting. Uh, growing food, people from the downtown east side here growing that food, uh, becoming farmers again. Uh, all of our ancestors, or almost all of our ancestors were farmers and um, so some people still in the city don't have that opportunity and it's actually a great career choice for some. So we've got acres now of farms uh, being developed here in Vancouver. Uh, part of our Greenest City goals, getting local food, uh, doubling the, the food assets we have in the city, being more food secure. But it really is, uh, there's a lot more goals across the Greenest City, I can talk more about that if, uh, if you have questions. So uh, this was a V-Pole concept, which uh, Doug Copeland uh, and I worked on. This is Doug's design work, and uh, this is integrating new technologies, making sure that we have, uh, we use street lights. The, the infrastructure we have throughout Vancouver, we have 40,000 street light poles, and well, what, how about we get wireless integrated, how we get electric vehicle charging, whatever parking service we need, how can we get all those functions into one, uh, one, one uh, pole and then how can we make it more interesting and beautiful? And Doug did a bunch of other design work that I don't have time to show, show off here, but it uh, got a lot of other cities calling saying, well, how did you do it? Where is it? And Well, we're still working on it. <laughs> so you haven't seen it on the streets yet, but it's, uh, it's, the next, it's the next big uh, innovation I think we'll see with city infrastructure that brings communications, Wi-Fi and electric vehicles and all this into, into the existing infrastructure and transforms how we do all that. Uh, there's, there's some of Doug's colors, color schemes. That one of his, his ideas was that we do it, kind of neighborhoods can pick different color schemes uh, uh, based on the colors that exist uh, here naturally rather than uh, that sort of dull green street pole thing we can get a little more creative with it. So that's uh, one idea. Here's, uh, here's one of the latest innovations that our engineering department has come up with. And for me, as uh, being in the business of uh, plastic bottles, uh, <coughs> forgive me, for uh, now we can turn plastic bottles into uh, plasphalt and, and actually uh, re take the blue bin recycling and uh, save money, save uh, pollution, save uh, worker health in uh, laying a different kind of uh, asphalt down and our, we're doing this in our streets now. Just an example of how people on the front lines, people uh, working at the city, actually if you enable it, if you say we got to do things differently, think creatively and, and come up with something new and different, it's phenomenal what happens in the most unlikely things. So economic development has been a big priority for me and uh, you know I, we have been powered by resource industries here for uh, many years, uh, decades, generations, and they continue to contribute enormously to Vancouver's economy. But it's actually the creative economy that is growing leaps and bounds here. And uh, I, I know many people here work in the creative industries. Uh, I made a goal uh, for Vancouver that we really focus on growing our creative industries. And digital media is, um, has been growing leaps, leaps and bounds. We've been, we've been attracting companies from all over. One of the companies that uh, I really wanted to be here in Vancouver was Indu Industrial Light and Magic, Lucasfilm. And I, it, I had a trip down to Vancouver with our economic commission and we arranged a meeting and, and on the phone they said, well just pull into the parking lot, come around the corner, we'll meet you at the uh, Yoda fountain. <laughs> and I thought, well, so here's the Yoda fountain. And uh, which, uh, 
which ended up being fortuitous because uh, they decided to set up a, a studio here in Vancouver. Last year, uh, they are creating jobs here on the ground in Vancouver with many other studios from California, but this was really their first venture outside of the, the, uh, the ranch in California and, and their facility here at the Presidio with the Yoda Fountain. So focusing beyond the, the usual and, and looking at the opportunities for creative industries to succeed here and for us to attract that investment, attract companies, attract more talent and be a real hub, uh, a globally significant hub. In digital media now we're in the top three with LA and London. So we've, uh, we've come a long way in very few number of years and that's because we have extraordinary talent and, and, uh, and belief that creative industries can make a difference here. So my job is, uh, is really dynamic, really fun and interesting. Uh, it, it can go from horrific at times dealing with, uh, with uh, big problems that we have, whether it's homelessness and gang wars and the, the challenges we have as uh, a society. It can also have some fun and interesting things and this is uh, me jamming with Dan Mangan and uh, David Byrne. Actually, that's not me with David Byrne. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to be that guy. <laughs> And uh, this is a very creative Vancouverite who we, we love dearly. So I get to sort of bounce around and see, um, well, the oldest woman in Canada, 112 years old. She, she died a year ago today, um, which, was, which was sad, but she uh, was 112 uh, and I get to kiss babies too. So I, I kind of <laughs> run the full gamut in, uh, in my day-to-day -day life. And um, I get to hang out with really cool people. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, and I get to, uh, unfortunately, experience uh, the, the extremes of our city, as I said. The, this was about 3 a.m. after the Stanley Cup riot, and um, walking through the streets as, as people, the guys were board, boarding up all of the broken uh, window storefronts, and uh, the police were dealing with the burned out cars. Uh, from that uh, kind of that all-nighter on the streets and dealing with the aftermath to uh, the next morning the next couple of days where the people of Vancouver came in and took over our streets and cleaned up and um, and we had the the graffiti walls happen which uh, at the beginning of that that morning that next morning a uh, bunch of us were milling around and or all these plywood blank plywood sheets as far as you can see on the bay and uh, and this, uh, this guy who I know lives on the street, actually he's now in, he got a place to live, but he was um, someone I knew and he said, hey, you know, Mr. Mayor, we don't have enough pens or markers. There's, there's a lineups of people and there, you know, there's like eight little mar magic markers happening at a time and all these people, hundreds of people pouring in there. So a couple of us were like, okay, let's go. Let's go find Sharpies, magic markers, whatever we can find. We ran into London Drugs. We, it was just like in the movies, you know, filling boxes with all these magic markers and uh, Sharpies and came up and uh, just started handing them out. And, and then it was just like, boom, uh, hundreds of people all with colors and, and writing and expressing and, and creating a whole different vision of, of what our city is from what had happened the night before. It was just an incredible outpouring and, um, and that idea came from a guy who lives on the street and saw it happening on the spot. And look what it turns into. They're, they're now, um, those boards are, um, are part of the Museum of Vancouver. So we've got them as, uh, as art for the future. Some, a lesson to learn from, uh, from some of the, the extremes that we faced. So again, I just, I'll just come back to um, to the, the need to be creative in our community and the importance of politics in that because uh, we can bring creativity to everything that we do and we in fact must do that to deal with the, the scale uh, and the, the difficulties that we face right now. Uh, I would encourage all of you to get involved more directly w w in community whether that's at the extreme of politics and government which, uh, which works for some of us. You might surprise yourself uh, how fun you find it and how readily you adapt to it. I never thought I could adapt to it, but uh, here I stand today. And uh, I hope I'm doing a good enough job to, to represent our city for uh, the years ahead. But that can be in many different ways and forms through the community, through uh, responsible business, 
through creating arts and culture and enlivening our community. All of that is direct and, and direct ways to embrace change and to drive the pace of change for the maximum positive impact. I think that's uh, ultimately, uh, it, it, we can shape the change. It's coming at us no matter what. It's inevitable. We can shape that for maximum positive outcomes if we, we use our, our creativity. That's, uh, that's the promise that we have and, and the incredible hope we have for our future. Uh, really engaging with our community and applying our creative selves to give the most. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Let's get right on to it, shall we? As uh, is normally our, 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 uh, our habit, I'm going to ask you the first question. Okay. You, in, your, in our interview with you, one of our questions was, uh, where do you find creative inspiration? And one of your answers that surprised me was in, I think you said, particularly lively meetings, in some lively meetings. Now, I chair a lot of meetings. I don't like, I don't feel inspired, really, <laughs> meetings, especially lively ones. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well, I, yeah, it's, it's not the norm. It's probably still the exception to the rule that lively meetings are where creativity can burst forth. But it does happen, and there are certainly ways and tools uh, that, that uh, can make that possible. I've, uh... Hey, what about that? <laughs> connections, more connections. So, uh, yeah, lively up the meetings. Uh, it's, it's really difficult. Uh, it's, the traditions are to just hunker down and slog through it. And uh, as, as a friend of mine said, most meetings, uh, you know, it's about, there's two people that are going to make the decisions in the meeting and it's just about how long it takes everybody else to kind of organize around that and let the two people make the decision, which is kind of sad and pathetic really. Um, but how to do uh, more interesting meetings, um, I'm doing a lot more walking meetings. Um, that's become a, a, a more of a tradition now, just go out, go for a walk and, and do your talk for whether it's half an hour or an hour. Uh, power walking and talking keeps the blood pumping outside fresh air. So that's uh, one thing that we're trying to do more of at City Hall. But uh, I, I do, a lot more of my inspiration does come from, uh, I think, being in large, getting the, like, the juice of large gatherings uh, or, or being in places that are full of life, like Stanley Park, where you just, you're surrounded by life force. And that, that's what stirs it up for me. But I know uh, to each their own. I think creative, creativity comes from all different sources and forms. And, and you just, that's all about finding your muse. But, but don't rule out meetings. It is possible. That's a great question. Okay. I'll see you are. I'm Shauna Johansson. Um, my question is, so you talked about the importance of creativity in politics and um, innovation and that kind of thing. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit towards the, um, the way in which perhaps politics or different governments are not open to creativity, in the sense that business as usual maybe has a barrier to creativity, and maybe what you see as ways to combat that, or how you deal with, you know, creativity versus that not maybe being okay in politics, which has a face and a, an agenda sometimes, etc. Yeah, really good question. So the city, I, I mean, I think. Creativity uh, is, is what can drive change. Governments are, are resist change. They're ba we basically design them to, to maintain the status quo, and which we have to do a lot of. You know, we have to keep, take care of the infrastructure of a city, take the garbage out, make sure that all of our poop goes away from us, uh, make sure we have clean, tasty drinking water coming to us. Those are essential functions, and that's kind of the, how the, the mechanism or structure of government got established to provide for all that. Uh, unfortunately, now we've got all kinds of factors that are complicating our lives and threatening our future, and that structure no longer will serve us. And it, historically, it's been uprisings, it's been grassroots change, it's been uh, a lot of people being creative and saying, you know what, this, is, this has to change, we have to do things differently now. And th it's been externally driven. Uh, but I think uh, there, there's, a, there's a balance to that. Some of us have to get in there and be in the internal drivers of change as well. And I've seen that. I've seen that in, in our city staff. There's all sorts of people who want to make change within the organization. There's elected officials. We get elected by the community to say, this is what we're going to go in and change. And, and we have to try and do that. It, it, you need those pressure points inside and outside. 
and uh, I, I think right now we're not seeing uh, anywhere near the kind of change we need to see provincially and federally. We have parliamentary systems that were designed many generations ago. There has not been innovation. There's not been electoral reform. Uh, many other countries around the world are transforming how they do democ democratic government, how they elect people from the community to make change happen. And uh, we're stuck in Canada, in BC, we're stuck. Uh, and, and you know, if we manage to get people in there who are willing to change the system, if, if the community at large says we have to change the way we, we elect our representatives and the way that government responds to the, the challenges, um, hopefully we can drive that change. But I don't think it's going to come from just straight up, same old, same old. It's not, it's not happening fast enough, which is where the creative side comes into this and where I hope the, the incredible amount of creativity that we have in this city, that we have in, uh, in cities across Canada, we'll, we'll be able to drive that change. I, that, that's, my, that's my hope that we can make real change happen. But it's going to come from a, a creative source and I think it, it will be driven a lot from the outside, as usual. Hi, I'm Leanne McLennan. I would like to ask you if you could talk a bit about the creative process that went into farming and, and uh, developing your juice. Well, it's, uh, there, that's a good question, uh, and it's uh, so long. Uh, well, my brain's full of politics and government these days. So it's hard to remember the exact, uh, the, the genesis and how we did it, but we were, um, basically the only way to survive was to, to hustle and come up with something new and different, uh, because the food system has been concentrated into a couple big huge companies that own every aspect of the food system and then there's like a, a wide array of uh, restaurants and small food uh, retail that's but, but it's it's small and and uh, and diverse but to actually succeed beyond the lifestyle companies uh, which which is what most restaurants and, and small farms and companies are you can certainly a few jobs to actually grow a business into the bigger leagues. You have to be really creative. We we did um, well. We had really creative meetings. Actually, we we bring people uh, in the company together and and try and you know think outside the box. It, it sounds like a cliche now, but it is a cliche actually. <laughs> we, but it was really about constantly challenging ourselves to how are we going to leapfrog out of the current paradigm in the food industry? Uh, what, what, what can we grow? How can we get it to new markets? People that want the food. Uh, we were a little ahead of the curve on this stuff. We started organic farming in 1990 and everything was growing leaps and bounds as fast as we could keep up with it. it was, so it was about uh, meeting demand that was already out there, but that meant all new different ways of doing things. So. Uh, unfortunately, it's very difficult to make a lot of money when you're being super creative and having to do things uh, completely different because uh, the system owns the money basically and they have the cheap and, and high margin ways of doing things. So um, we, just, uh, we just embraced every opportunity to, to work around the, the, the current industry paradigms and uh, connect with people who appreciate it and love the food and would be willing to do something about that, you know, spread the word. And uh, we have had a lot of champions in Vancouver. There's a lot of foodies here, and, and we've seen unbelievable growth in local food and uh, healthier, tastier, extraordinary cultures coming together with food. So we have everything going for us in that department. Still, it's overall a minority. Um, I think most of the food still comes through the big supermarkets, and it's uh, from far away. Uh, that's still the majority. So, but we're, we're farther along than most cities in, in, in North America or even the world on that on that level. And that's because people are willing to embrace the change and think of different ways of interacting with their food. Okay, we're going to do one more question. Greg has to go. Uh, I do. Required somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know that. <laughs> Gregor, it's, it's really clear that there's been enormous creativity in the way. Um, your government administration has talked to people, but I'm wondering if there's this groundswell of innovation that's happening around collaboration and the way citizens of the government. Are there, we're wondering, are there more innovative ways the city can listen or incorporate uh, the voices of citizens? Um, politics is, is still an antagonistic in a us and them game. I'm wondering, are there, can we look at those sort of collaborative models or do those square? Do those square at all? It's a, it's a really good question. It's, uh, 
coming back to the, we have these forms, we, we've built a structure and this is how it works. Um, changing it is challenging, actually changing how the city works, a lot of that has to be done at the province because they have the legislation called the Vancouver Charter that says you can do these things, you can't borrow more than this money for anything related to the east side of Vancouver. It's, it's like crazy old school rules that we're under and that has to be changed in a parliament in Victoria which is a creature of the parliament in Ottawa so we can, we're trying to do things differently uh, on the ground here and um, we just struck an engaged city task force, 21 people and Mark is going to be one of them, which is great. Uh, we, <laughs> terrifying. But to really look at, diff at new ways to both engage people in uh, the life of the city and the way that we govern and also how the community works, how, how we deal with uh, ex the, the loneliness and uh, the feelings of exclusion that people feel, uh, the cross-cultural barriers that we still have. Uh, we have more harmony here than most places in the world, but we, we got to grapple with all this stuff. And the way that we've been doing that over these last four years is just bring people together, bring people who are willing, who are creative, who, who are, are bright and willing to dedicate time to this, and try and open it up over and over. You know, that this is a task force. We expect it to just to reach out in different rings, different circles, and uh, and get more voices to the table because uh, ultimately it all shrinks down and, and there's a city council, 11 people, and we have to you know, vote amongst ourselves and make decisions. And uh, th that's, that's how the, the hierarchical model works. We're, we're trying to flatten that and get as many voices as we can from the community and, and putting the best ideas forward and, and giving people a sense that they can shape our future here. It's, uh, the construct is difficult right now, but we're trying to work around that every way we can and, and uh, engage as many people as we can in, in running the city. Okay, thank you very much. That's it, thank okay. You, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, sorry we can go longer, but I'm getting, I'm getting tugged like crazy from the